Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering RSA Conference 2020 San Francisco. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at RSA 2020. It's the biggest security conference in the country, if not the world. I'm guessing there's got to be 50,000 people. We'll get the official word tomorrow. It's our sixth year here and we're excited to be back. I'm not sure why it's 2020. We're supposed to know everything at this point in time with the benefit of hindsight. But we've got two people that do know a lot. We're excited to have them. On my left is Chris Betts. He's the SVP and Chief Security Officer for CenturyLink. Chris, great to see you. Great to see you, Jeff. And to his left is Chris Smith, the VP Global Security Services for CenturyLink. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys just flew into town? Yep, just for the conference. It's, uh, it's great to be here. This is always a really exciting space with just a ton of new technology coming out. So let's just jump into it. What I think is the most interesting and challenging part of this particular show, we go to a lot of shows. We do 100 shows a year. I don't know that there's one that's got kind of the breadth and depth of vendors um, from the really, really big to the really, really small that you have here. And you know, with the expansion of Moscone, they're even packing more of them in underneath Howard Street. What advice do you give to people who are coming here for the first time, especially on more the, 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 the buyer side, as to how do you navigate this place? <laughs> when, when, I, when I come here, CSO, I'm always looking at what the new technologies are. But honestly, having a new technology is not good enough. Attackers are coming up with new attacks all the time. The big trick for me is understanding how they integrate into my other solutions. And so I'm not so I'm not just focused on the technology, I'm focused on how they all fit together. And so the vendors that have solutions that fit together, that really makes a difference in my book. And so I'm looking for, for products that are designed to work with each other, not just separate. From a practice standpoint, the theme of RSA this year is the human element. And for us, if you look at this floor, it's overwhelming. And if you're a CISO of, a, of an average enterprise, it's hard to figure out what you need to buy and how to build a practice with all of the emerging tools. So for us, core to our practice, I think core to any mature security practice is having a pro services capability and a consulting capability that can piece all this all together, that helps you understand what to buy, what things to piece together, and how to make it all work. Right, and, and it's funny, the human element, because that is the, the kind of the global theme, and, and what's funny is for all the technology, it sounds like still, you know, the easiest way in is through the person, whether it's a phishing attack or, or a, there's a myriad of ways that people are getting in through the human. So that's kind of a special challenge. You're trying to use technology to help people do a better job, but at the end of the day, sometimes your squishiest or easiest access point is not a piece of technology, but it's actually a person. It's often because we ask people to do the wrong things. We're, we're having them focus on security steps. I'll, I'll use email security as an easy to, to grasp example. We all go through training every year to teach folks how to make sure that they avoid clicking on the wrong emails. Um, for us, more often than a year. And so the, the downside of that is that we're asking people to take a step away from their job and try to figure out how to protect themselves and is this a bad email instead of really focusing on the job. And so that's why it's so important to me to make sure that we've got solutions that help make the human better. And frankly, it's even worse than security. We don't have the staff that we need. And so, how do we help make sure that the right tools are there, that they work together, and that they automate? Because asking everybody to, to take those steps is it, just its a recipe for disaster because people are going to make mistakes. Right, well let's go a little deeper into the email thing. A, a friend of mine is in commercial real estate, and he was describing an email that he got like from his banker uh, describing a wire transfer from one of his suppliers that he has a regular ongoing banking relationship with, you know, it's not the bad pronunciation and bad grammar and, you know, kind of the things that used to jump out as an obvious bad email. He said it was super good to the point where, thankfully, you know, it was just mistimed, but, you know, he called the banker and he's like, did you just send me this thing? So, you know, where does, as the sophistication of the bad guys goes up, it's specifically targeting people, how do you try to keep up with that? How do you try to give them the tools to know, whoa, 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 versus I'm being efficient, I'm trying to get my job done? For me, it starts with technology that takes, look, we've only got so many security practitioners in the company, and I have to defend, like in your email example, we've got to defend every user from those kinds of problems. And so, 
how do I find technology solutions that help take the load off the security practitioners so they can focus on the niche examples that are really, really well-crafted emails and, and, and help take that load off the user because users just are not going to be able to handle that. Right. It, it's, it's not fair to ask them and like you said, it was just poorly timed that helped protect. And so, how do we help make sure that we're taking that technology load off, identify the threats in advance, and, and, and protect them? And so I think one of the biggest things that Chris and I talk a lot about is how do our solutions help make it easier for people to secure themselves instead of just providing only a technolo technology advantage? Our strategy for the portfolio, and it's sort of tied to the complexity you see on this floor, is the simplicity. So from our perspective, our goal as a network service provider is to deliver threat-free traffic to our customers even before it gets to the human being. And uh, We've got an announcement that we launched just a week ago in advance of the show called Rapid Threat Defense. And the idea is to take our mature threat intel practice that Chris has a team of folks focused on that we branded Black Lotus Labs. And we built a machine learning practice that takes all the bad things that we see out in the network and protects customers before it gets to their people and to the edge of their network. Right, so that's an interesting take, because you, you uh, have the benefit of seeing a lot of network traffic from a lot of customers, and not just the stuff that's coming into my building. So you get a much more aggregated approach. So tell us a little bit more about that, and, and, and what is the Black Lotus Labs doing? And, and I'm also curious, from an industry point of view, you know, is this a collaboration with the industry? Because you guys are carrying a lot of traffic, there's other big network providers, carrying a lot of traffic. How well do you kind of work together when you identify some nasty new thing that's, that's, that's new in the horizon? <laughs> and where do you, you know, kind of draw the line between better together versus still a competitive environment? When, when we're talking about making the internet safer, it's not really to me a lot about uh, competitive environment. It's really about better together. That's one of the things I love about the security community. I'm sure you see it every year when you're here and you're talking to security practitioners, how across every industry, the security folks work together to accomplish something that's meaningful. And so, yeah, as the largest, world's largest you know, global ISP, um, we get to see a ton of traffic, and, and it's really, really interesting what we're able to put together. You know, at any given point in time, we're watching many tens of thousands of probable malware networks. We're protecting our customers from that. But we're also able to, ourselves, take down nearly 65 malware networks every month, just knock them off the internet. So we identify the command and control and we take it off the internet. And we work with our partners. We go talk to hosting providers who may be competitors of ours, and we say, hey, here's a bad, a bad address, here's a bad server that's being used to control malware go and shut it down. And so, the result of that is not only protecting our customers, but more importantly, protecting tens of thousands of customers every month by removing malware networks that were attacking them. And, and that really makes a difference to me. I, that, that, to me, that's the biggest impact we bring. And so, it really is a better together, it's a collaboration story. And of course, we, as Chris said, we get the benefit of that information as we're developing it, as we're building it, we can protect our customers right away while we're building the confidence necessary to take something as dramatic an action as shutting down a malware network right. uh, unilaterally. Well, Citrix, I was going to ask you kind of the impact of IoT, right, in this, in this crazy expansion of attack services, which we hear about all the time. One of my favorite examples, somebody told the story of you know, attacking a casino through the connected thermometer in the fish tank in the lobby, which <laughs> yep. may or may not be true, it's still a great story. It's a great story. But, but I'm curious, you know, looking at the network feeding versus the devices connecting, that's really an interesting way to, to attack kind of this proliferation of attack services because you're getting it before it necessarily gets to all these new points of presence and doing it based on the source. For us, that's the tank. only way to make it scalable is through that automation. Blocking it before it gets to the edge or to the device is what will create simplicity and value for our customers. Right. Well, and the other piece of the automation, of course, that we hear about all the time is there just aren't enough security professionals, period. Um, and so, if you don't have the automation, you don't have the machine learning, to, as you said, to filter the low-hanging fruit and to focus your resources where they need to be, you're not going to do it. The bad news is the bad guys have, <laughs> have this similar tools. So, as you look at kind of the increase in speed of automation, the increase in automated connectivity between these devices making decisions amongst each other, how do you see that kind of evolving? What's your kind of role in making sure you stay a step ahead of the bad guys? For me, it's not about just automation, 
It's about allowing smart people to put their, their brains against hard problems, hard impactful problems. And so, the, and, and so simply automating is not enough. It's making sure that automation is reducing the, the, the load on people so that they're able to focus on those hard, unique problems and really solve, solve those solutions. And yes, attackers, attackers build automation as well. And so if we're not building faster and better, then we're falling behind. And so like every other part of this race, it's about getting better, faster, and again, it's why it's so important that technology work together because we're, we're constantly throwing out more new tools. And if they don't work better together, even if we got incremental automation in each place, we still miss overall because it's end to end that we need to defend ourselves right. and defend our customers. You have something else? <laughs> Layered on to what he said, for the foreseeable future, you're going to need smart security people to help protect your practice. Our goal in automation is to take the, the, the rote tasks out of, out, out of the day, the day lives so they can focus on the things that provide the most value in protecting their enterprise. Right. And when you're looking, you talked about making sure things work together, or you talked about making sure things work together. How do you decide what's kind of on the top of the on the top of the stack, right? Everybody wants to own the single plane of glass, everybody wants to be the control plane, everybody wants to be that thing that's on your computer all the time, which is how you, you work your day to day. How do you kind of dictate, you know, what are the top level tools while still going out and as you said, exploring some of these really cutting edge things out around the fringe, which don't necessarily have a full stack solution that you're going to rely on, but might have some cool kind of point solutions, if you will, or point products to help you plug some new and emerging holes. So for us, um, we take our security capabilities and we build them into the other things that we sell so it's not a bolt-on. So when you buy things from us, whether, whether it's bandwidth or whether it's SD-WAN security comes baked in, so it's not something you have to worry about um, integrating later. It's an ingredient of the things that we sell, and all of the automation that we build is built into our practice, so it's simple for our customers to understand and consume. Like simple. And then layered on top of that, um, we've got a couple different ways that we bring pro services and consulting to our practice. So we've got a smart group of folks that can lean in and do staff augment and sit on site and do just about anything to help a customer build a practice from day zero to something more mature. But now we're toying with taking those folks and building them into the, the products and services that we sell for 10 or 20 hours a month as an ingredient. So you get that consulting wrapper on top of the portfolio that we sell as a service provider. So Chris, I'll get your take on, on kind of budgets and how people should think about their budgets. And when I think of security, I can't help but think of like insurance. Um, because you can't spend all your money on security, but you want to spend the right amount on security, but at the end of the day, you can't be 100% secure, right? So it's kind of a, you're kind of working the margins game and you got to make hard trade-offs and marketing wants their money and product development wants their money and sales wants their money. So when people are trying to assess kind of their risk and their investment trade-offs, what are some of the things they should be thinking about to determine what is the proper investment on security, because it can't just be, you know, lock everything down 100%, it's not realistic and they don't have the money. How do, they, how do you help people frame that? Usually when companies come to us and CenturyLink plays in every different segment all the way down to, you know, five people company all the way to the biggest multinationals on the planet. So that question is, and the budget is a little bit different depending on the type of customer, the maturity and the lens they're looking at it. So, Typically, we, we have a group of folks that we call security account managers, those are our consultants, and we bring them in either in a dedicated or a shared way to help companies assess where their practice is today and what tool sets they're using and um, the things that they need to purchase and integrate to get to where they need to be. So it's really kind of a needs analysis based on, on gaps as much as anything else? Yes. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why we try to build, to Chris's earlier comments, so, so many of the technologies into our solutions so that, so that you, you buy, you buy you know, SD-WAN from us and you get a security story as part of it, is that that, that allows it, you, the, the, use, the uh, customer to save money and, and to really have one seamless solution that just provides that secure experience. I mean, we've been building firewalls and, and doing network-based security for, gosh, going on two, two decades now in different places, and so 
you know, at this point, that is a good place that we, we understand well. We can apply automation against it. We can dovetail it into existing services and then allow focus on other areas of security. So it both helps from a financial standpoint. It also helps customers understand from where they put their talent. Because as you talked about, it's all about talent, even more so than money. Yes, we need to watch our budgets, but if you buy these tools, how do you going to, it's about the talent to deploy them. And the easier you can make it to do that, the simpler, I think the better off you're going right. to be. Right. Typically, we had the most success selling security practices when somebody's either under attack or compromised, right? Then the budget opens right up and it's not a problem anymore. So we thought about how to solve that commercially and I'll just use DDoS as an example. We have a big DDoS, global DDoS practice that's designed to protect customers that have applications out on the internet that are business critical. And if they go down, whether it's an e-commerce or a trading site, they're losing millions of dollars a day. And some companies have the money to buy that up front and just have it as a service. And some companies don't purchase it from us until they're under attack. And the legacy telco way of deploying that service was an order and a quote, and you know, some days later we turn it up. So we've invested with Chris's team a whole orchestration layer to turn it up in minutes and not months. So you can go to our portal, you can enter a few simple commercial turns and turn it on when you need it. So that's interesting, because I was going to ask you kind of how has cloud you know, kind of changed the whole go to market and the way people think about it and, and, and even then you hear people have stuff that's secure in the cloud but they, they, they you know, misconfigured a switch and left something open. Um, but you're saying too, it enables you to deploy in a very, very different manner based on you know, kind of business conditions and, and to not have that old you know, get a requisition, get a PO, requisition, yep. order, install, <laughs> config, all that other yep. kind of crazy stuff. Okay, so before I let you go, kind of the last question, what are your kind of priorities for this RSA show for CenturyLink? What is top of mind? Obviously you have the, the report and the, the Black Lotus. What are you guys really prioritizing for this next week here in San Francisco? We're here to help customers. We have a number of customers that want to learn about our solutions and that's always my priority. And, and I mentioned earlier, we, we just put out a, re a press release for our rapid threat defense. So we're here to talk about that and educate the industry on what we're doing that's a little bit different. I get to work with Chris Motion this week with the customers, which is a ton of fun. The other part that I'm really excited about is I get to go spend a bunch of time with partners uh, and potential partners, because we're always looking at how we bring more better together. And so one of the things that we're both focused on is making sure that we're able to provide more solutions. And so the trick is, is finding those right partners who are ready to do the API level integration. The other things that Chris was talking about that really make this a seamless end-to-end -end experience. And I think we've got a set of them that are really, really interested in that. And so those conversations this week are going to be exceptional because I think it's going to help build better technologies for our customers even six months from now. All right, great. Well, thanks for, uh, for kicking off your week with theCUBE and have a terrific week. Thanks for having Thank you. All right, he's Chris, he's Chris. I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. We're at the RSA conference, downtown San Francisco. Thanks for watching, see you next time.